I would say that that is primarily governed by the education of the individuals themselves. The smarter you are about knowing how that system works, how that algorithm works, you don't have to be a full-fledged programmer, but as long as you have a general idea and a respect for how that system works, you can look at it and at least understand what it's trying to say and can see if somebody's mucking with the system. Plus, what's the term? I can't think of the term, but if you get enough bees in the hive working towards that, one or two idiots screwing it up are going to get washed out by the many others that aren't, and they will catch the bugs. You can have self-correcting systems. And so it now boils down to one key aspect of, of the resource-based economy, the cultural value system of the people involved in creating those algorithms, those products, or whatever. Are they raised in a mindset to believe that, ha, 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 I'm going to be the evildoer and I'm going to get more for myself, or are they raised in a system that respects that what we're trying to do is help maintain efficiency for all? And that's the only mindset that they've ever had, or that's the mindset that they've adopted, because during the transition, you're going to have both, and you're going to have this conflict at some point. And, I, and the transition is the hardest bit. You know? But once you prove things to be viable, the transition becomes a little easier because more people can buy into it once they see that it works, and it's no longer just a paper, a paper rocket. And so then you get to the point of the people writing those algorithms are doing it for the sole purpose of actually making sure that the system is efficient for all. And it's actually not hard to track. You can have ancillary systems written by other people, different groups. Competition. Yes, you're right, competition. Like I said, competition's fine. But this is competition without a money-based paradigm. This is a competition of we're going to cross-check you, and you can cross-check us, and we're going to make sure that at the end of the day, we're still covering everybody's mutual needs. How do you... So it sounds like you could potentially come up with some sort of quality of life index, but then the question would be, who is it that determines the algorithm for the quality of life index? Well, the quality of life index would be the highest possible for the given state of knowledge. I mean, that's always changing, right? I mean, the medical advancements we have today are at one level, like kidney dialysis. I don't know if you watch, like, I'll give a funny example, but like Star Trek, um, the one where they go back in time because of the Save the Whales or whatever. I don't remember which yeah. one that was. Yeah. But they're in the hospital, and this woman's like, I'm going through dialysis. And, and the du McCoy is like, what? These are cavemen. And they give, he gives her a pill, and the pill fixes the whole thing. So which is the better quality of life? In either case, she's trying to get fixed, but one was a lot better than the other because of technological advancement. Mm -hmm. What used to be dialysis and a very painful, annoying process mm -hmm. is now solved by a pill. So as we evolve, that quality of life index is in a constant state of flux. The key thing here is not so much a quality of life index, but giving accessibility so that people can choose their own personal quality of life index. I want to live in the woods. I want to live in the city. I want to live in the middle. I like some of this technology, but I don't want some of that technology. As long as you have the free choice based on the abundance that is created by the systems that are serving humanity, not people serving people, but the machines serving the people and doing our bidding, what we want to, to make everybody raise to a high level. That's the key important thing. Mm -hmm. There's really no algorithm for that. That's just based on social development, innovative development, technological development, and giving people the choice to go on the path that they want. Sure. A, a lot of your ideas, and they're very uh, well-reasoned and well-argued, uh, and a lot of them uh, sound like they could be pretty promising. I guess, as you said, it'd be great to see a test city because I'm still not 100% sure that uh, this, uh, the, the means of distribution and technological advance, and still I have uh, very little faith in, uh, because history has demonstrated, whenever you create a institution, or uh, there seems to be some hierarchy, be it machines and humans or machines and, and people that uh, consume, uh, but whenever you create those institutions, the person that's going to educate themselves on how to prevent abuse or how to create a higher quality of life, there's also going to be potentially individuals educating themselves on how to manipulate the system for their own benefit. And I would like to see how that could potentially be overcame. But I think this could mesh uh, in a major way with uh, my particular philosophy, which could, uh, it's more and more, I've been exploring anarcho-capitalism, which is, uh, I've heard of that. No. Uh, uh, anarchy basically meaning the absence of the hierarchical state, which is really not an anti, I like the term voluntarism, where all society is based on mutually beneficial voluntary associations, which it seems that y'all's That's what the mm -hmm. resource-based economy yeah. is based on. Right. You said, where are you going to get those people? They're the volunteers. They're the ones that That's want right. to do that. Sure. So we share that same common interest. And uh, 
uh, uh, this was put to me by a gentleman from the Free State Project. They're trying to actually build a free society. Many, many of them are now participating outside of the state monopoly. They're running into a little bit of problem with the pesky property tax, of course, but they're generally working to build the ideal free society, or at least their ideal free society. But uh, he put it to me like uh, anarcho-capitalism can be the program, uh, so to speak, that other societies are built on top of, like it's an operating system on a computer, and you run different programs. So, and I just want to see if this would mesh with, with your ideals, and if it does, then, you know, let's work together. But uh, you guys have the freedom to create your own society based on Venus Project, based on resource-based economy uh, over this mass geographic area. Me and my anarcho-capitalist libertarian buddies also have the right to create our society based on division of labor, based on specialization, based on free markets, uh, and with a money-based system. And we prefer not a debt-based money system. So as long as you can create an environment whereby different cultures, different individuals, different people who have different definitions of what type of society they believe would bring about their most ideal situation, you guys can do that uh, wherever you so choose. If you all want to set it up here in Austin or on the outskirts or maybe people start levitating to, towards one spot. And of course this is in the transition phase. As long as uh, you guys are okay with another society forming and, and uh, based on different values, a different ideology, different philosophy, as long as there's no grander, and this is usually a status totalitarian thing where, and you said earlier, some people say, nope, this is the way that it's got to be, this is the way it's going to be, and this is the way it has to be for everybody, because if it's not this way, then who are we to say that we're not going to be taken over by the people that still do it the old way? I have a more uh, uh, philosophy that just says, you know, you guys want to build your uh, uh, resource-based economy? I'd like to come stay there for a while, check it out. Maybe we could trade amongst ourselves. And one of the things I'm wary well, of, again, is the efficiency. How? If you're running on a money system and we're running on a non-money system, what is the compatible trade mechanism? We're right. doing everything straight volunteer with no system of exchange using mm -hmm. technical abundance. Mm -hmm. You're running on division of labor using a monetary proxy to facilitate the exchange of those resources. Mm -hmm. We're not compatible systems in that effect, so how do we interact together. I think that's where you run into the it's going to be one way or the other scenario. Mm -hmm. Like the whole planet basically runs on the monetary system. Any any advanced form of interaction in the human They're species They're forcing today, the planet to yeah, run on the monetary system. Yeah, it runs on the monetary system. So now that evolved over time. So who's to say that the resource-based econ economic system won't also evolve over time and just Mm -hmm. to, you know. And it very well may, and the idea of anarcho-capitalism, going back to the throwing the capitalism on, is that societies would compete, and it could be one way that we could trade would be perhaps uh, if self-interest is allowed to flourish uninhibited by uh, monopoly state capitalism, we could potentially in the anarcho-capitalist society be able to create more efficient and effective widgets than what you guys have going over here, and you guys could through communication, see what's going on with this other society and say, you know what, that particular widget or that particular TV system like we spoke of earlier seems to operate a little uh, better than ours. Maybe we could potentially come up with some sort of yeah, way to mutually benefit each other. Yeah, and it wouldn't necessarily that. have to be in, in dollars because obviously you guys aren't using that. Right. But it, it would have like to go back to straight trade and barter, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. stuff. The well, flick was uh, seemed to be so anti-barter. Like, uh, ant barter seems like just a natural uh, output of, yeah. of human relationships. Is, are you guys anti-barter too? I, I don't think it serves a purpose anymore. It's not that I'm anti. I think it served a purpose when it was necessary. But again, we get into the abundance paradigm. If I have free access to whatever I want, whenever I want it, what am I supposed to barter with? Mm -hmm. I don't need to barter. There's no requirement to do so. So that's where it breaks down the whole need for money. If What's the point of needing a system of exchange if that which you want to exchange is readily abundant for all people. Sure. And so that's where it completely disintegrates. I would, uh, uh, um, a word of advice, in the meantime, in the transition to you guys ideal, sometimes, because I know it's anti-anti-debt-based monetary system, and uh, my girlfriend actually, she's a libertarian as well, but she seems to be very anti-money. She doesn't like the idea of people having to uh, go you know, steady to the job. Yeah. I just see it as people building value in society that would make you desirable to trade amongst so you could mutually benefit yeah. each other. However, a as a transition, one of the best ways to get off of uh, your dependence on the Federal Reserve note, which is one of our common enemies because mm -hmm. it's debt-based and mm -hmm. you know, they steal value from it, is to barter. Because 
that way, not only do you avoid using Federal Reserve notes and having your value stolen from you by the you know monopolistic elite, but you also avoid the dang income tax too, right. which is yeah. a, a big stretcher. So there might be some things that the movie just came off like anti-barter, barter, barter, where it seems like bartering would help transition you guys to y'all's society. I would say that in a transitionary sense, I could see where bartering would become applicable um, in a transition sense. Yeah, and I'd like to see more literature if you guys have some on how this transition would play about because I think that's a big important point that a lot of movements say we're just going to get there, it's going to happen, right. and they don't actually stop and practically see how and, it And we about. really do need to develop reports on that and we don't have a lot of that yet. I mean, I'm one of the, the senior people who, I don't want to say senior, I don't yeah. like that word, but you know, I'm one of the more knowledgeable people to yeah. generate kind of reports like that, but yeah. I'm only one man, so I can only do so much. and and. There's this no, people also have to realize, and I know we're probably running short on time, but people also need to realize that even though the Venus Project has been around for 30 odd years, the movement and the awareness of what the Venus Project even is is only like a year and a half, two years old. I haven't really been around that long mm -hmm. uh, as far as in the public eye. So as we gather more support and more people to have those capabilities, whether they agree with the Venus Project or not is irrelevant. You can write up a report that suggests one way or the other, and that's valuable information to know one way or the other how something, how a transition might manifest. Mm -hmm. um, so I envision the transition as getting enough support and enough resources, in the case of, in this case, money, to build a test city that would prove the points, work out the bugs, get that set up. Once that's set up, go to other governments around the world and say, do you think these are viable systems that could be used within your local resources and we'll modify it to fit what you're capable of? and then just start popping them out here and there. And as people like them and gravitate toward them, then it just starts to grow. And then at some point, the barrel falls over. And you know, it's either becomes really, really good and billions of people start enjoying it, and the old system just whew, gets replaced. Not that it's overthrown, but a better system just evolves Competition. out of it. Competition. Yeah. Well, speaking on, uh, on the transition, John, I know that uh, Peter Joseph, the filmmaker of the Zeitgeist Films, uh, his last radio podcast was on specifically the transition, a possible like, a possible best case scenario transition. Mm -hmm. um, he also says unlikely, you know, scenario, sure. as well as a, a, a likely one, which is more of a chaotic type of a one. But also the third film that comes out next week in the theaters, you know, we're hosting it here at the Alamo Draft House, mm -hmm. South Lamar. I want you to be there, please. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure he's going to be going into possible transition solutions. In that as well, so, and I know that's the big thing everybody wants to know about, how do you transition into this? Mm -hmm. How do you transition into this type of an environment? Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, man, with that, I just uh, I want to say thank you so much. Yeah. For being in the house, man. Yeah, right on, it was pretty uh, enlightening, definitely. Really? Yeah, yeah, it really was. This is, this is, Appreciate this is it. gonna travel far and wide. Doug? Thank you. Thank you so much, man. Appreciate you having me, thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely, and John? Yeah. Pleasure, man. Yeah, nice Absolutely. to meet you. Absolutely, take care, have a great one. Yeah. Um, thank you everybody for tuning in, and uh, you know, as usual, every week, tune in live to Zeitgeist Live, and uh, we'll see you next time.